Hey Oscilloscope fans, today we're going to look at part two of how to read an oscilloscope data sheet. Mike and I geeked out for 38 minutes walking through an oscilloscope data sheet, all the different specs you have to think about and care about. If you missed part one, make sure to click the card, check the description and the first comment for a link to part one. This is part two, we're going to kick it off with DC vertical gain accuracy. So accuracy is a really interesting topic to think about in a data sheet. Um, this is kind of, a, I'm just going to you know, throw caution to the wind and say this. Oscilloscope vendors don't specify accuracy for AC signals. We have frequency response. You know, we have to stay within the 3 dB mm -hmm. range, and there's a whole flatness thing, and you can get plots often. But when we're going to spec accuracy, we spec DC accuracy. Well, I guess what do you mean by AC accuracy? Do so you mean frequency accuracy, um, like on the frequency domain, or so the warrant. This is so DC vertical gain accuracy right here. This yeah. line item, two percent of full scale after warming up for thirty minutes. Is right. what the little two is. That's the warranted spec for a. That's basically for a single measurement point. I guess you could say no. The accuracy it's not of a for, single it's for sample. a DC input signal. I I think I. I I, I, I know this from my support days. I had like a form email that I sent when I got this question from the new support reps. Okay. I just thought it was related to accuracy no. off of off of zero. Uh-uh. No, so it's basically... People, I remember people hit us up all the time like, hey, how I want to use it as a multimeter, basically. I'm like, no, yeah, buy so, a multimeter. And that's where I'm going with this. Yeah. If, you, if you need to measure like a DC... Accuracy is super fine-tuned. The yeah. oscilloscope is not the tool for you. No. And you go look at all these oscilloscope data sheets, and they're all going to say DC vertical gain accuracy. And that means if I plug in a 2-volt DC signal, how close am I going to actually get to 2 volts? Right. Um, and AC, it's not. It's usually pretty good. You know, you can look at the frequency response and see that it's fine. Okay. Um, but the warranted spec is DC vertical gain accuracy. Yep. So if you put in a 1 kilohertz sine wave, that's 1 volt peak to peak. You know, it's that be one, one volt, volt plus or minus 4%, basically, you're, right? Potentially. Well, theoretically, but that's not that's the measure. I know there's the it cursor should be, accuracy. And it usually is... will be, but that's not warranted. Yeah. yeah. Right. Isn't that crazy? Hmm. Yeah. That always blew my mind. Like, oh, but there's probably too, too much of a variety of signals for us to specify it in a warrantable way. Uh, right? Yeah. Like yeah. I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, you could probably try to break it somehow um, based on slew rates and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, so that's what everyone specifies is DC vertical gain accuracy. And then there's additional uncertainties on top of that, which is offset. So as you start to add offset, you know, plus or minus the division, plus millivolts, plus 1% of the offset setting. Um, Somebody really bored should go do like a, a history lesson of data sheets because I found that a lot of our data sheets mm -hmm. in the oscilloscope industry from all vendors are organized Pretty much the same. We all have the same warranted specifications. Yeah. I wonder what started what. Like, when did DC vertical gain accuracy first get spec'd, and how long was it until everyone else had to follow suit? I don't know. Right? Yeah. I'm, surely it's been a thing. Yeah. You know? Well, and then you get to like DC vertical accuracy, which is essentially the accuracy you're going to use in most situations. It's like, okay, it's a summation of all the other things plus another uncertainty factor. Right. It's like, ah. Um, but that's just normal for all scopes. Life is uncertain. You deserve <laughs> yeah. first. Right. Um, and this may or may not be in 50 ohm mode. I don't know. Um, I think it'll often say. I don't see that anywhere. Uh, isolation. So if you plug in a signal into one channel, what happens on the others? Mm -hmm. um, and then offset range. So if you're working with ripple and that type of thing, um, you, how much offset can you actually use and get? Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can max it out. Um, and once you start maxing that, you have to go to probe options. So like power rail probes and that type of thing. Um, so something to think about is offset range. Um, so now we have the same thing, but for digital channels. So that was all analog channels mm -hmm. vertically. That was not time accuracy or anything like that. Right, that comes to the next Just page. Just vertical. Um, so vertical system digital channels, same thing. There's you know threshold ranges. The, pretty much every digital channel is going to, on any scope, is going to meet like your threshold requirements and that type of thing. Right. Um, sometimes there's a bandwidth difference between the digital channels and the analog channels. Interesting choice of words there, Daniel. Do you see bandwidth specified anywhere there? I do not. A couple data sheets we have just because people ask so much. Uh, bandwidth for digital channels is is not a thing. Hmm. We don't, it's we can't, because bandwidth is a measurement of rise time. What's the rise time oh. of a digital channel? 
Yeah. I guess it would be what would Infinite the rise time be zero? if you put, you know, if you allowed it to view analog signals, I guess, but then the hardware would be different. So what we, yeah. what we do specify is toggle rate. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure if it's even on there, is it? I don't see it. Thresholds, threshold selections. I know the toggle Input rate voltage. is like it's like 250 accuracy. Oh, there's a cat cat ranking on the the digital imp- so like with your DMM or something. Yeah. You know? Um. Huh. I guess the toggle rate impedance. isn't on here. Maybe, maybe it's, it's on the next page. Yeah. Let's maybe. Go down. Oh. Mm, not seeing it. So we went to horizontal. No, there it is. There oh. it is. Minimum detectable pulse ah. width five okay. nanoseconds. So you, there can, you, go. you can build it out from there. So you do have a. A faux bandwidth, or fake bandwidth. yeah. It's not actually, bandwidth. that's a good point. Never yeah, <laughs> and oftentimes people just like insist on us giving them a number, so we'll estimate something. But in this case, it's five nanoseconds minimum detectable pulse width. So that would be a period a of ten nanoseconds. So reverse that for yeah. your frequency, like a hundred hundred megahertz or something like that. Uh, okay, is the equivalent. Interesting. So, anyway, it fun, makes sense that it'd be under horizontal and not vertical. Yeah, um, think about it. Okay, horizontal system analog channels. Um, so this is like your time-based accuracy, essentially. Um, well, time-based accuracy. It's like I've done this before. Um, <laughs> warranted specs. So it's going to be in a part per million, and then timing chips and hardware, they start to age out. Yeah. So once you recal, it helps. Um, but things just get old and nasty. I don't know if calibration... I just turned 30 a few days ago. Please don't remind me. It's mm. kind of a sore subject. Mm. Oh, I'm not there yet. Ah. <laughs> Well, it's because I'm old. Right. I've aged at least five parts per billion. I, I'm, <laughs> yeah. Have you <laughs> parts per billion? <laughs> um, I don't remember the details of PPM versus specking time specifically. I, I don't know why we do that. Um, but it's out there. We'll write a blog on it or something. Um, time-based delay range. So how far, you know, we had the offset, how far you can offset a channel. We also have how far horizontally you can offset a channel. Um, that you can't really fix with probes but you could fix with like an external trigger in which will also be on here somewhere if you're trying to collect more than 500 seconds worth of data again right um that's a pretty extreme example i haven't run into too many people over <clears throat> over the years needing more delay but uh no it's it's uh there's a couple situations with like trigger delay and acquisition delay right and there's some funkiness there well the thing the way it works is if we want to get a little nerdy for a second the memory <laughs> the memory arc we're reading well, the data sheet Mike. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> If you really want to geek out, uh, we use what's called a, uh, oh darn, what's the cool computer science word for it? I already forgot. Our memory architecture is... Like is, a circular is buffer. Is circular, thank you. It's yeah. a circular memory architecture. And so we, uh, and what the trigger system does is it throws a little bookmark in that memory system once it detects a trigger event. Well, if you're if you're if you're filling up the entire circular buffer before a trigger event happens, that's by definition the most pre-trigger information you can right. possibly capture. So there's a limit to that, and then post-trigger, uh, you can get real cute with, because once we have a trigger event, then we can just slow down the sample rate as much as we want to give you more time after the trigger. Which is essentially what we do with uh, segmented memory, right? right? The whole, like, identifying a trigger event and then popping it in. Um, time-based, delta time accuracy is kind of a fun one using cursors. So it's your time-based accuracy reading plus your screen width plus some, you know, cursor mm-hmm. funkiness of 100 picoseconds, which isn't not that much at all. Yeah, if you're worried about picoseconds, so you're not buying a 3000 T. <laughs> no, no. no. Um, modes, so there's like your main normal mode, zoom mode, roll mode, XY mode. Uh, sometimes there's like a Z blanking mode where you can use a third channel to like trigger as an external trigger. Mm-hmm. In. Um, there's also an Easter egg mode called beast mode. Beast mode. I'm intimately familiar with beast mode. Yeah. yeah. So see if you guys can find it out there. Is so, that actually a mode? Yeah, it's pretty tough to find. Oh, really? I'll have to find it later. Challenge for you. Um, X, Y mode. Oh, there you go. Z blanking on external trigger input. So, ta-da. This is, people use X, Y mode in like manufacturing environments mm-hmm. and just to make cool signals. Um, I found that the people that use X, Y mode are really passionate about it. I had oh, a guy man. corner me at a trade show in Germany and talk oh. about X, Y mode yes. and how we can make it, make improvements to it for like 20 minutes. Well, like the, the problem is... Since, I haven't used it since college. No. And in analog oscilloscopes, X Y mode was brilliant. Yeah, it was just like the bee's knees. Um, and when when we switched over to digital scopes, X Y mode took a pretty big hit because people don't really use it that much. Right, and it's just not a thing people use except for like you know basic page relationship stuff. So 
Yeah. X Y one out for X Y mode. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, no. Um, I yeah. Last time I think I spilled the whole soda all over the table. <laughs> cool. Oh dang it. Hey, opa. <laughs> um, we talked about the horizontal digital channels acquisition system. You want to talk about that at all? Yeah, this is where things get really fun. Like Mike said, this is where things get really fun. So if you haven't had enough fun yet, two videos of Oscilloscope data sheets wasn't enough. There is a third one coming. There's a playlist for that. The third one will be added to that playlist once that video goes live. And make sure you subscribe to the Keysight Labs YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Cool. Oh, dang it. Hey, opa! <laughs>